mysterious disappearances happen all over the world. What's truly frightening are the ones that are unsolved. Loved ones cannot truly get closure on what exactly happened, and the sliver of hope may still linger within their hearts as to some days, the ones who disappeared just might come back as suddenly as they left. However, this is not the case with the disappearance of Chris Creamer and Lizanne Froon. For these girls, there will be no such happy ending. Today, we will be discussing the infamous case of the Panama disappearances. Chris Kramer and Lizanne Froon are two aspiring Dutch students who have recently graduated from university. To celebrate, they decided to take a trip to Panama where they have arranged sightseeing and a volunteer opportunity at a local language school. On March 15, 2014, the two girls boarded a plane from Amsterdam to Costa Rica. Both were eager as can be as they saved a long time for this trip, not knowing the horrible fate that lies ahead. From there, they traveled to Boca del Toro, Panama, where they partied and made friends with locals and tourists alike. The two girls parted ways with their new friends and set out for their next destination a small city named Bokeh. They stayed at a local host family where they were eager for the following weeks where they are supposed to be starting their volunteering. However, unfortunate news struck as the local language school decided to delay their schedule for a week, which suddenly left them disappointed and without a plan. To make the most of the trip, the two decided to take a hike on the Pianista Trail a path well known by the locals for its beautiful scenery. Chris and Lizanne took a taxi to the base of the trail and started the hike around 11 a.m. in the morning. Strangely enough, later during the investigation, the taxi driver who drove the girls to the spot claimed to have dropped them off in the afternoon at 1.40. As they hiked, the residents near the trail warned the girls not to go up alone, but they were quickly dismissed. This was the last time anyone ever saw them. That night, the host family which the two girls stayed at did not see them return and began to go worried. They searched the nearby areas around the home, but the girls were never found. One day has passed and no news has been heard from Chris and Lizanne. The local tour guide who was scheduled to give a private tour to the girls on this day arrived and joined in on the search. He was the first to enter the girls' room, only to be faced with two empty beds. The situation was reported to the authorities, and an aerial search was conducted on the following day to no avail. It was curious as to why the two girls couldn't just wait a day, so they would be with someone more familiar with the location, but human desire is something not to be controlled. Four days go by and the parents of the two has had enough of waiting. Along with a team of private investigators, they flew to Panama in hopes of finding the girls themselves. Their efforts, however, were in vain. A full ten weeks go by without any lead. Then, in June, a backpack was found near the local riverbanks of Culebra, nearly eight kilometers away from where they were last seen. The bag was delivered to the police by the same tour guide who was scheduled with the two girls. The backpack was relatively clean and did not have any water damages despite being found in the harsh conditions of a river. In the backpack were two folded bras, two sunglasses, an empty water bottle, a digital camera, passports and medical documentations, cash, and both of the girls' cell phones. The contents which came from the call history of the cell phones were strange to say the least. Here, we can see the exact times of each call made by the two girls. On April 1st, the first call was made at 5.39pm and another was made around 10 minutes later to 9.11 and 1.12, Panama's and Dutch's emergency hotlines. The calls did not go through as there were no signal in the area they were in. At this point, 
we can safely assume that the girls were in danger. Why would anyone call the emergency line unless they were in a seriously troublesome situation? We can also see that there are huge gaps between each of the attempts to contact with the emergency hotline, some of them being more than 15 hours. On the second day, April 22nd, the Zan's phone was able to make connection for around 2 seconds at 6.58am, but it was immediately hanged up and the phone was then shut off. It was also strange on how long the phones were actually running for, and it was confirmed that there were only 50% battery left on each phone when they had just started hiking. Over the course of the next few days, the phones were turned on and off interchangeably in trying to make connection. However, they would be immediately turned right off. If we take a look at the calls made by Chris's phone from April 4th to April 6th, we can see that the calls that are made midday are roughly the same time, one being around 10 to 11 and another one being around 1.30. This seems as though someone was deliberately scheduling calls to the emergency hotline. What's even stranger was that starting from April 5th, there were multiple attempts at unlocking Chris's phone by using the wrong pin code. One should know that you don't need to have the right passcode to call the emergency line, because there is simply an option on the home screen for that. Did something terrible happen to Chris and Lizanne had to take her phone, or was someone else in possession of it? Now let's move on to the contents of the digital camera. Let me assure you, what it contains are what this case is famous for. Not only are the photos eerie and disturbing, it gives the viewer a sense of helplessness as we potentially witness the final moments of the girls firsthand. The camera was a fully functional Canon SX270 HS digital camera and within the memory card, hundreds of photos of the girls' vacation were found. Out of these, 133 photos were related to the event starting from April 1st. The first couple of photos were nothing out of the ordinary. We can see Chris and Lazanne having fun and enjoying themselves as they hiked up a trail. The photos taken on April 1st are listed from 479 to 508. What's strange is that image 509 was intentionally deleted while having its memory slots that were stored in the camera. This can only happen when a person wants to delete a photo within an album, as the data for the photo will be deleted, but the space that the photo originally held still existed. Experts, however, could not recover the details of this photo and its content will be forever missing, leaving us with many unanswered questions. Could the girls have deleted such a photo? If it was someone else who deleted the photo, what could it have possibly contained? The times of these photos match with the expected time of the hike, being around 11am. With the confirmation of the time being around noon, then the statement given by the taxi driver would be false. Could he be in on this? We unfortunately might never know as he died under unexplained circumstances on March 2nd, 2015. If you wish to read up on all the details of this case, I will link a lengthy blog down in the description. Now let's take a look at the nighttime photos. All 90 of these were taken a week after the disappearance on April 8th. Strangely, the times that these photos are taken all range within the early hours of 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. This individual is situated on top of a rocky cliff with lots of plant life around them. The odd nature of these photos sparks many questions. Why were they taken? Were they only using the flashlight for the camera? If so, did they not use it any of the other nights? One particular photo shows a little branch which is decorated with what seems to be like red plastic. Was this a sign? Or was it something even more sinister? What 
you see here is Chris's hair. This photo was found within the ones that were taken during the night and was the most striking to me. Could this be an indication that Chris has received a fatal injury? We know that her phone had the wrong password entered later during the disappearance, so we know something must have happened to her. Was the branch with the red plastic related to her? The nighttime photos brings up way more questions than answers, which gives me the impression that they were done deliberately. A month goes by, and the notoriety of this case becomes bigger and bigger. Then, a pair of neatly folded jeans, a pair of shoes which one of them contained a severed foot, half a piece of pelvic bone, and 33 bone fragments were discovered several kilometers away from where the backpack was originally found. The one who discovered this was, you guessed it, no other than the same local tour guide. After DNA sampling, it was concluded that the severed foot and the bone pieces belonged to Lizanne and the pelvic bone belonged to Chris. I can't imagine the grief their parents would be when they first received the devastating news. Upon further observations, the foot that belonged to Lizanne showed no sign of trauma as the cut was nice and clean. What's also interesting is that Chris's bone was bleached and had no tissue matter. Under natural circumstances, it would be extremely difficult for this to occur, leading many to believe foul play was involved in this case. From here, the case went cold for a few months. In August, the sudden discovery of Lizanne's tibia and femur bone, along with a rolled up piece of skin, once again brought attention to this case. What's strange was that the skin showed little to no sign of decomposition, which would be impossible if it was left out in the elements for so long. These would be the final pieces of the remains ever discovered. To the surprise of many, Panama officials eventually declared the death of Chris Creamer and Lizanne Froon accidental. No one was satisfied with this verdict. There are known gang activities around Boca del Toro, and this has not been the first time a foreign visitor has found trouble. In August of 2009, a British man named Alex Hemphrey disappeared while hiking the exact same trail. In 2017, Catherine Jonet was found beat and strangled in the same area. There are much more cases like these, which suggested that this area was not the safest place to visit. Now, let's move on to theories as to what could have possibly happened. The girls could have simply gotten lost after a wrong turn on the trail. They tried making phone calls but couldn't get in connection with the emergency hotline due to their remote location and they shut off their phone to conserve energy. However, this seems like a far-fetched theory because it doesn't explain any of the oddities of this case. After the girls have gotten lost, they would have surely needed to find food to keep their energies up. During this process, the girls could have accidentally ingested hallucinogens, which would have resulted in their erratic behavior. The photos taken on early morning of the 8th could have been them under the influence of some drugs. This would have explained some of the strange behavior throughout the incident, but not the rest. Wouldn't the girls have stopped ingesting whatever that was causing hallucinations as soon as they felt ill? Let's move on to the next theory. Foul play, in my opinion, is the most plausible of the theories. There are just too many inconsistencies for this case to be ruled as accidental. The question remains, who could have been the killer? With the evidence at hand, I believe it was the action of many, starting with the local tour guide who was hired to take the girls around. His name is Feliciano, and let's just say, he doesn't have the best customer service. Online comments about Feliciano are not pleasant, as it is stated that he was often pushy and only picked girls to take tours on. 
because of the frequent local gang activity, I highly suspect that the tour guide agency had some connections with the local gangs. On outings, the tour guide would first notify the gang members so they would not be active around the areas that the tour was taking place to prevent causing any trouble. When the local language school changed plans, the girls were restless and wanted Semver to vent. We can assume that the girls were in contact with the tour guide from the evidence of his business card being found with their personal belongings. It is highly possible that they have asked him where they could go for a hike and the tour guide suggested the trail and this is where their plan changed. Human trafficking is highly common in these parts of the world. I believe the gangs from Panama engaged in human trafficking. We can also assume that Feliciano knew Chris and Lazanne were attractive girls and could have easily contacted the gang to let them know of the two's location. During the hike, the girls were then kidnapped by the members of the local gang. The taxi driver was probably in on it as well. On the day after the disappearances, Feliciano was the first to enter the girls' room. He could have covered up most of the potential evidence along with taking the charger for their phones and camera. This could be a reason why the phones lasted for so long as he was just simply charging it. He was in possession of both phones and was in charge of calling the emergency number periodically to create the illusion that the girls were lost and trying to seek help. The scheduled phone calls do match with a person who has regular work schedule since they would only have time to call during break. On the 6th, things escalated as the parents of the girls came to Panama, along with their private detectives. The local gang starts to panic as the girls are in their custody, and as to what the girls are going through, I really don't want or need to get into it. To cover up for their crime, they deliberately set up a photo shoot in the early morning of the 8th to make it look like the girls met their fate under supernatural conditions. These so-called evidence was just created to throw the investigation off track as nothing valuable can be attained. This case, however, grew in popularity due to its perplexing nature. Chris was then chosen to be killed off to link up with the photo of her hair. The public was already suspecting the death of Chris, so the gang could have just ran with the word on the street as a cover-up. Lizanne would have potentially been alive, but both her feet were cut off to prevent her from running away. Then, their remains were scattered for the police to find. Now with these evidence, the public was more prone to believe that Chris had injured herself and both girls died to natural circumstances. Feliciano was probably ordered by the gang to help with finding the evidence. This is why both times it was him that led the police to find the backpack and the remains. I also believe Panama officials have a general idea of the case being related to foul play, but due to the impact it will have on the tourism industry, they decided to cover it up. Lizanne might have been left alive for a few months where she eventually succumbed to her injuries. Her remains were then scattered and then found. Which explains why the tibia, femur bone, and the skin piece had barely any decomposition as she may have just recently died. Whatever the answer may be, this is definitely an odd case. Some days, I hope the truth can surface giving the people involved closure. Remember, please do your research before traveling to an unknown place.